The Tiger Rising, Chapter 27 The first key slid into the first lock so smoothly that it made Rob dizzy with amazement. It was going to be so easy to let the tiger go. Hurry, Sistine said to him. Hurry up, get the other locks. He opened the second lock and the third, and then he took them off one by one and handed them to Sistine, who laid them on the ground. Now open the door, she said. Rob's heart pounded and fluttered in his chest. What if he eats us? He asked. He won't, said Sistine. He'll leave us alone out of gratitude. We're his emancipators. Rob flung the door wide. Get out of the way, he shouted, and they both jumped back from the door and waited. But the tiger ignored them. He continued to pace back and forth in the cage, oblivious to the open door. Go on, Rob said to him. You're free, Sistine whispered, but the tiger did not even look in the direction of the door. Sistine crept forward and grabbed hold of the cage. She shook it. Get out, she screamed. Come on, she said, turning to Rob. Help me, help me get him out. Rob grabbed hold of the fence and shook it. Get, he said. The tiger stopped pacing and turned to stare at them both clinging like monkeys to the cage. Go on, Rob shouted, suddenly furious. He shook the cage harder. He yelled. He put his head back and howled, and he saw that the sky above them was thick with clouds, and that made him even angrier. He yelled louder. He shouted at the dark sky. He shook the cage as hard as he could. Sistine put a hand on his arm. Shh, she said. He's leaving. Watch. As they stared, the tiger stepped with grace and delicacy out of the cage. He put his nose up and sniffed. He took one tiny step and then another. Then he stopped and stood still. Sistine clapped her hands and the tiger turned and looked back at them both, his eyes blazing. And then he started to run. He ran so fast, it looked to Rob like he was flying. His muscles moved like a river. It was hard to believe that a cage ever contained him. It didn't seem possible. The tiger went leaping through the grass, moving farther and farther away from Rob and Sistine. He looked like the sun rising and setting again and again. And watching him go, Rob felt his own heart rising and falling, beating in time. Chapter 28 Oh, said Sistine in that voice that Rob loved. See, she said, that was the right thing. That was the right thing to do. Rob nodded, but in his mind, he saw a flash of green. He remembered what happened to Cricket. What? said Sistine, turning to him. What are you thinking about? Rob shook his head. Nothing, he told her. Robert! The sound of his name came floating to them from the direction of the motel. That's my dad, he said, confused. That's my dad calling me. And then they heard Willie Mae. Do Jesus, she screamed, her voice high and wild. And then there was the crack of a gun. They both stood still, stunned and silent. And when Willie Mae came running out from under the pine trees and saw them, she stopped. Thank you, Jesus, she said, looking up at the sky. Two whole children, thank you. Come here, she said. She opened her arms. Come to me. Rob started walking toward her. He wanted to tell her that she was wrong. He wanted to tell her that he did not feel whole, but he did not have the energy or the heart to say anything. All he could manage was putting one foot in front of the other. All he could do was keep walking toward Willie May. Willie May led them back, and when Rob saw the tiger on the ground and his father standing over it holding the rifle, he felt something rise up in him, an anger as big and powerful as the tiger. Bigger. You killed him, he said to his father. I had to, his father said. That was my tiger, Rob screamed. You killed him. You killed my tiger. He ran at his father and attacked him. He beat him with his fists. He kicked him. But his father stood like a wall. 
He held the gun up over his head and kept his eyes open and took each hit without blinking. And Rob saw that hitting wasn't going to be enough. So he did something he thought he would never do. He opened his suitcase and the words sprang out of it, coiled and explosive. I wish it had been you, he screamed. I wish it had been you that died. I hate you. You ain't the one I need. I need her. I need her. The world and everything in it seemed to stop moving. He stared at his father. His father stared at him. Say her name, Rob screamed into the silence. You say it. Caroline, his father whispered with the gun still over his head, with his eyes still open. And with that word, with the small sound of his mother's name, the world lurched back into motion. Like an old merry-go-round, it started to spin again. His father put the gun down and pulled Rob to him. Caroline, his father whispered, Caroline, Caroline, Caroline. Rob buried his face in his father's shirt. It smelled like sweat and turpentine and green leaves. I need her, Rob said. I need her too, said his father, pulling Rob closer. But we don't got her, neither one of us. What we got, all we got, is each other, and we got to learn to make do with that. I ain't gonna cry, Rob said, shutting his eyes, but the tears leaked out of him anyway. Then they came in a rush he couldn't stop. He cried from somewhere deep inside of himself, from the place where his mother had been, the same place that the tiger had been and was gone from now. Rob looked up and saw his father wiping tears from his own eyes. All right, said his father, holding Rob tight. That's all right, he said. You're okay. When Rob finally looked up again, he saw Willie Mae holding Sistine like she was a baby, rocking her and saying, shh. Willie Mae stared back at him. Don't you think you're going to start pounding on me now, she said. No, ma'am, said Rob. He wiped the back of his hand across his nose and slid out of his father's arms. I went and got your daddy, Willie Mae said, to, told Rob as she swayed back and forth, rocking Sistine. I figured out what you was going to do, and there ain't no telling what that tiger would have done once he got out of that cage. I went and got your daddy so he could save you. Yes, ma'am, said Rob. He went and stood over the open-eyed tiger. The bullet hole in his head was small, was red and small. It didn't look big enough to kill him. Go ahead and touch him, said Sistine. Rob looked up. She was standing behind him. Her dress was twisted and wrinkled. Her eyes were red. Rob stared at her and she nodded. So he knelt and put out a hand and placed it on the tiger's head. He felt the tears rise up in him again. Sistine crouched down next to him. She put her hand on the tiger too. He was so pretty, she said. He was one of the prettiest things I have ever seen. Rob nodded. We have to have a funeral for him, Sistine said. He's a fallen warrior. We have to bury him right. Rob sat down next to the tiger and ran his hand over the rough fur again and again while the tears traveled down his cheeks and dropped onto the ground. Chapter 29 Rob and his father worked with shovels to dig a hole that was deep enough and wide enough and dark enough to hold the tiger. And the whole time, it rained. We gotta say some words over him, said Willie Mae when the hole was dug and the tiger was in it. Can't cover up nothing without saying some words. I'll say the poem, said Sistine. She folded her hands in front of her and looked down at the ground. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, she recited. Rob closed his eyes. 
What immortal hand or eye could frame that fearful symmetry? Sistine continued. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? To Rob, the words sounded like music, but better. His eyes filled up with tears again. He worried that now that he started crying, he might never stop. That's all I remember, Sistine said after a minute. There's more to it, but I can't remember it all. You say something now, Rob, she said. I don't got nothing to say, said Rob, except for I loved him. Well, said Willie Mae, what I got to say is I ain't had good experiences with animals in cages. She reached into her dress pocket and took out the wooden bird and bent down and laid it on top of the tiger. That ain't nothing, she said to the tiger. Just a little bird to keep you company. She stepped back away from the grave. Rob's father cleared his throat. He hummed softly and Rob thought he was going to sing, but instead he shook his head and said, I had to shoot him. I'm sorry, but I had to shoot him for Rob. Rob leaned into his father and it felt for a minute like his father leaned back. Then Rob picked up his shovel and started covering the tiger with dirt. As he filled the grave, something danced and flickered on his arm. Rob stared at it, wondering what it was, and then he recognized it. It was the sun, showing up in time for another funeral. I'm sorry I made you do it, Sistine said to Rob when he was done. He wouldn't be dead if I hadn't made you do it. It's all right, Rob said. I ain't sorry about what I did. We can make a headstone for him, said Sistine. And we can bring flowers and put them on his grave. Fresh ones, every day. She slipped her hand into his. I didn't mean what I said before about you being a sissy. And I don't hate you. You're my best friend. The whole way back to the Kentucky Star, Rob held onto Sistine's hand. He marveled at what a small hand it was and how much comfort there was in holding on to it. And he marveled, too, at how different he felt inside, how much lighter, as if he had set something heavy down and walked away from it without bothering to look back. Chapter 30. That night, his father sang to Rob as he put the medicine on his legs. He sang the song about mining for gold, the one that he used to sing with Rob's mother. When he was done with the medicine and the song, he cleared his throat and said, Caroline loved that song. Me too, Rob told him. I like it too. His father stood up. You're going to have to tell Beauchamp that you was the one that let the tiger go. Yes, sir, said Rob. I'll tell him I was the one who shot him, but you got to admit to letting him go. Yes, sir, said Rob again. I might could lose my job over it, his father said. I know it, Rob told him, but he wasn't afraid. He thought about Beauchamp's shaking hands. Beauchamp was the coward. He knew that now. I thought I would tell him I could pay, I could work for him to pay for what I'd done. You can offer up some reasonable kind of solution, said his father, but it don't mean he'll go for it. There ain't no predicting Beauchamp other than to say he's going to be mad. Rob nodded. And on Monday, his father continued, I aim to call that principal and tell him you're going back to school. I ain't messing around with taking you to more doctors. You're going back and that's that. Yes, sir, said Rob. He didn't mind the thought of going back to school. School was where Sistine would be. His father cleared his throat. It's hard for me to talk about your mama. I would never have believed that I could miss somebody the way I miss her. Saying her name pains me. He bent his head and concentrated on putting the cap on the tube of medicine. But I'll say it for you, he said. I'll try on account of you. Rob looked at his father's hands. They were the hands that had held the gun that shot the tiger. They were the hands that put the medicine on his legs. They were the hands that had held him when he cried. They were complicated hands, 
Rob thought. You want some macaroni and cheese for dinner? His father asked, looking back up at Rob. That sounds all right, said Rob. Macaroni and cheese sounds real good. That night, Rob dreamed he and Sistine were standing at the grave of the tiger. They were watching and waiting. He didn't know for what. But then he saw a flutter of green wings and he understood. It was the wooden bird, only he wasn't made of wood. He was real. And he flew up out of the tiger's grave and they chased him, laughing and bumping into each other. They tried to catch him, but they couldn't. The bird flew higher and higher until he disappeared into the sky that looked just like the Sistine ceiling. In his dream, Rob stood and stared up at the sky, admiring all the figures and the colors, watching as the bird disappeared into them. See, said Sistine in his dream, I told you it was like fireworks. He woke up smiling, staring at the ceiling of the motel room. Guess what? His father called to him from outside. What? Rob called back. There ain't a cloud in the sky, said his father. That's what. Rob nodded. He lay in bed and watched the sun poke its way through his curtain. He thought about Sistine and the tiger he wanted to make for her. He thought about what kind of wood he would use and how big he would make the tiger. He thought about how happy Sistine would be when she saw it. He lay in bed and considered the future. And outside his window, the tiny neon Kentucky star rose and fell and rose and fell, competing bravely with the light of the morning sun.